I'm David Levi Strauss, chair of the art writing program here at the School yeah, of Visual is. Arts, and this is our Coyote Talk series. And this event is co-sponsored by the BFA program in photo and video here at SBA as well. Um, I'll let Matt introduce everyone and set things up, but I just wanted to say that um, what the people are doing in Standing Rock is what we should all be doing, standing up for clean water, environmental justice, and climate sanity. The massive response by the National Guard and military, militarized police on the banks of the Missouri River with their armored vehicles, automatic weapons, tasers, batons, dogs, sound cannons, and pepper spray indicates just how important this uprising is. Um, it's got to be real bodies in real time and space. Matt? Hi everyone, uh, thanks a lot for coming. We're happy to be here and happy to talk about uh, our trip and some of our analysis of uh, Standing Rock and what's happening. Uh, I'm Matt Peterson, I'm from here in New York and uh, I'm part of a space called Woodbine in Ridgewood, Queens. And, um, I guess I'll introduce everyone. Malik and I work on a project together called The Native and the Refugee, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Vanessa is a student here at SVA in the BFA program in photography and video, and came out to shoot with us. And Sean is a comrade and writer and a political agitator who uh, accompanied us on the trip. Uh, so we'll all kind of do a presentation together and share our experiences. Um, and a lot of the photographs that we'll show in the presentation were by Vanessa. Um, Sean, do you want to start with the Indian winter concept? So, um, the the name the name of um, our <clears throat> the the name for the presentation we got from uh, a friend and one of the organizers that we got to know there, who um, were saying that the the very beginning of the encampment, he had kind of been going around trying to convince other folks involved that. They needed to call the movement they were part of the Indian Winter um, because of its resonance with the, the Arab Spring and as a way to kind of symbolize the, um, the, the way in which while the struggle of Santa Rock has its own very particular history of kind of particularly the Lakota and general indigenous people in the Americas, the struggle right now also has a lot of kind of general similarity with the other kind of global uprisings going on right now, the Arab Spring, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, and then also in very specific ways it's related to the ZAD and the TAB and these particular kind of blockades against infrastructure going on in France and Italy and other parts of the world. So that's one thing that we really moved by talking to him. And um, one thing we're trying to kind of explore in this project is the kind of intersection between the very particular history of struggle and the kind of like general global moment of struggle that kind of meets at Standing Rock right now. So um, yeah, as you can see, this was basically the first flag we saw there, the Palestinian flag. Uh, pretty much as soon as we got there, um, when we were at Sacred Ground Camp, which is the first camp. But this is good to talk about um, the project that I've been working with Matt on now for two years, called The Native and the Refugee. And the project is basically, um, it's part, re part research project, part multimedia, um, multimedia kind of artist, uh, artist thing that basically analyzes and um, compares native reservations and Palestinian refugee camps as spaces of autonomy and spaces that are kind of exceptional within the nation state and also are um, markers and repositories of a very specific history of uh, territorial displacement. And so we found both sites useful ways to talk about settler colonialism, nationalism, different relationships to land. And our, we, we uh, in relation to Standing Rock, one of the reservations that we focused on was Pine Ridge. Um, so we had been to Pine Ridge um, twice spent time there and got to know people and a lot of the people that we got to know at Pine Ridge from our time shooting there were um, some of the same people who were leaders and organizers at Standing Rock. Pine Ridge being another Lakota reservation um, not too too far away relatively speaking in the Midwest everything's quite far from our standards but so yeah so that's basically um, the background of Native and the Refugee and how um, our work in Pine Ridge kind of prepared us or, or helped facilitate us coming down to Standing Rock in the first place. So one of the times, the first time we went to Pine Ridge, it was during uh, the Ferguson protests, and this was uh, the first picture in the top left, is uh, some of us and friends. Um, 
This is a, a gas station in Pine Ridge called Big Bats. And uh, Big Bats basically effectively functions as the Grand Central of Pine Ridge. It's like the, the main kind of hub or thoroughfare. And a lot of the people we met at this time in December 2014, as Malik's saying, would become the kind of basically lead into the Red Warrior camp or the Wild Oglala camp. Uh, because the Oglala Lakota, who are from Pine Ridge, very much have this kind of warrior mentality. Um, but one of the things we were struck by increasingly as, as the movement of Stang Rock has continued is it has to be seen at least as the biggest kind of rebellion in the U.S. since at least Ferguson uh, in the summer of 2014, summer fall of 2014. If not, going back further, um, maybe back to Wounded Knee of 1973 and maybe 68, not just because of, well, one, not just proportionally, but actually, you know, total, the amount of participants in Standing Rock is quite large, and, and the consistency and duration of it is quite kind of, in many ways, exceeds the kind of urban kind of rebellions or insurrections that we might think of with Black Lives Matter. I don't know if it's kind of, as a, and as a national phenomenon, has exceeded Occupy's kind of participation as a localized place is probably the biggest thing in decades in the U.S., which is quite remarkable, I think, if you think of just how remote uh, the location Standing Rock is. Um, it's, not, it's not a gathering in New York City or Washington, D.C. or Chicago or San Francisco. It's kind of an hour outside of Bismarck, North Dakota. Bismarck, the capital, it's a city of 60,000 people. And then this is an hour south of that, you know, super remote. So I think we should, you know, when we think about Standing Rock or talk about Standing Rock, we should think of it in, in parallel to stuff like Ferguson or Occupy Wall Street or some of these things and not, not kind of like, uh, I don't want to say belittle it, but kind of marginalize it as some kind of fringe native environmental movement. No, it's, it's just as big as Ferguson. And in some way, you can make an argument that it's bigger. Um, and of course, below is the kind of iconic image or photo from Ferguson with this kind of American, you know, t-shirt flag is, is amazing. You see some things like this. Another thing, just quickly to talk about some of this stuff for a little while, people wanted to kind of emphasize some of the Native Lives Matter thing and not simply think of what's happening in Standing Rock as a purely environmental movement, because in fact, Native Americans have incredibly high rates of uh, being killed by police that rival or even exceed African Americans. And one of the kind of racial polarizations or discourses or narratives in America is between black and white, which has a way of kind of ignoring or erasing other kind of racial issues within the United States, in particular Native Americans, which are typically kind of invisibilized or erased. Or so if you look at you know this chart, you can see you know it's a the proportion is is much lower because there's obviously not a, as many Native Americans, but if you think of actually how much are, are being shot or killed by police, or the the rates of incarceration are similarly high. Uh, in comparison. So we should also think about this in terms of what's kind of animating the Standing Rock movement and also what's animating the kind of conflict or confrontations with the police. It's not simply about the environment or the pipeline, but the kind of kind of poverty or abjection that's experienced in Native communities rivals, you know, any other kind of impoverished uh, subject within the U.S. This image, just real quick, um, was actually put out by the Morton County Sheriff's Department. Um, and they were kind of saying, oh, look, you know, this kind of narrative of outside agitators or something, and the green is North Dakota. But as Malik said, Pine Ridge is directly below it in South Dakota. It's the same people. It's the Lakota people, all part of the Great Sioux Nation, which we'll get into. And it's funny to see, like, the Morton County Sheriff's Department's kind of narrative or attempt at creating a media campaign, defending or justifying what they're doing. Where obviously this map is kind of heroic. You know, badge of honor, I would think, for the Standing Rock movement that people have come from all over the U.S. And if you would include Canada or Mexico or whatever, you hopefully would see more arrows, you know, uh, coming in. Um, just the the extent of kind of participation is uh, is quite large, but you see this kind of conflictual dynamic about uh, who are the people or who are the true people that should be allowed to kind of protest this uh, this pipeline or why. Just a couple more things, uh, we'll pass it on. We'll break up the presentation in some different sections, but one of the things that's also about Standing Rock to point out, the two biggest visible signifiers, I would say, are the, uh, the flag of the American Indian Movement, uh, which still kind of looms everywhere throughout the camp, 
And the second one would be the flag of the, the so-called unity flag or the flag of the Mohawk Warrior Society. And very much you see in Standing Rock um, this kind of revival or resurgence of a warrior identity, a native warrior identity, which comes very much from the American Indian Movement, which is in the top, uh, in the Wounded Knee Occupation in Pine Ridge, 73, armed, kind of very 70s, cool, retro, post, you know, Vietnam, whatever. Then the Ochre Crisis in 1990, which was in Quebec, which is a largely Mohawk or Haudenosaunee kind of operation. You see the camouflage kind of aesthetic kind of coming in at that point, masked, very heavily armed, uh, and kind of in, in an almost insane kind of way. And then the third one would be the Zapatistas in Chiapas in 94, masked, armed, uh, all of which I think become kind of inspirations or some of the historical touch points for the contemporary kind of native warrior identity or legacy that you're seeing now within Standing Rock, in particular with the Red Warrior Camp, which is where we stayed. Um, but these things are really touchstones, I think, for the whole movement. And you'll see if you, you know, we'll maybe show some stills or video from the camp, you see these warrior flags or the aim flags basically everywhere. So when you're dealing with the um, Oseti Seko and the Seven Council fires, basically, um the, the, there's like very many subdivisions that almost, uh, I mean, they go belong, beyond this almost down to the family, but it would start with, you have the Sioux people would be like the common phrase in English, and then they have different divisions of Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota. And um, the, the people of Standing Rock are members of the Lakota nation, as are the people in Pine Ridge. And then within that, <clears throat> you have different um, bands. So you see amongst the Lakota, you have the Ogallala, who are the people of Pine Ridge, and the Honkapapa, who are the people of Standing Rock. So, and then within each band, you have different families, and then within each family, you have different branches of the family. So basically, if I could get philosophical, if you want to contrast it with citizenship, where everything is flattened out, and you're all just citizens there, actually every individual is connected to a wider circuit of meaning through his ancestry. Um, kind of like a leaves on a tree where it would all, each leaf is an individual, but it all goes back to one base. So that's kind of how ancestry is spread out. And each band uh, amongst the Lakota are kind of on a different reservation. So this is very much a gathering of the different Lakota tribes um, into one place. And the Lakota have a very particular, well, in some ways it's, it's like all Native history, but it, it has its own very intense particularities that we're going to go into a little bit and that, how that manifests in terms of uh, the state of reservations today and the importance of the struggle at Standing Rock. Just real quick, part of the oh, significance of this slide is that um, the 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 main the main camp at Standing Rock is called the uh, Eseti Saquon, right. and this is the first time since the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn and then the kind of like massacre wounded knee and the separation of Lakota into reservations that the seven kind of council leadership of the Lakota has been reunited in one place. So it, um, be, beyond the particular fact about the pipeline, in that sense. Um, for the people there, it's a very important historical moment that has been 150 years in the making. So, okay, so we're going to get uh, a little bit into the, um, the composition of the camp itself. Uh, basically, what you do is you, what you have is you have basically maybe three layers of people or types of people who are at the camp. On the first level is the Lakota themselves, um, not just from Standing Rock, but from the other um, reservations, who for them, this is very particular. It's about a particular river. Um, pollution of a particular um, area and a particular land tied to a unique history where environmental um, kind of, you know, infrastructural projects by the United States have been used as a method of warfare on their nation. So for them it's not an abstract environmental issue, it's actually quite political. Uh, it's, it's almost like a national issue for them because of the way uh, environmental infringement has been used upon to infringe on their actual sovereignty. It's also a spiritual issue. So from the Lakota, it goes broader into like an indigenous solidarity. So then you have on the second layer would be different people from different tribes throughout the United States or throughout all of North America, what they refer to as Turtle Island, coming over in a tremendous display of indigenous unity and native solidarity, which is also unprecedented. This is arguably, you could make a case that this is the largest um, native gathering ever in history, representing more tribes than ever. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of, um, materially uh, manifested by the flag row. When you get there, the most striking visual marker of Standing Rock is the main boulevard lined with flags. And the majority of these flags are flags of different tribes or bands 
throughout um, North America and even into South and Central America. So that would be probably the second layer. Uh, and then the third layer are the non-native kind of environmental activists who are there to kind of, you know, kind of everything ranging from hippie kind of green peace over to something a little bit more hard-edged, communists or things like that. But different groups of people for different political affiliations there to protect the environment. So between the, the non-native, the widely indigenous, and the specific Lakota, I think it's three different kind of layers of people who are there and, um, yeah. So just quickly, as we were talking about the breakdown, the Standing Rock Indian Reservation is kind of parceled out. It's formed and officially formed in 1889, but it's kind of connected to these different reservations that were broken up. Um, and you can see the different, they're all of these same broader uh, the council fires. Um, and you think the there's this parallel history happening of the incorporation of the Dakota Territory in 1861, later admitted into statehood in 1889, so North Dakota and South Dakota, so you have these kind of buying histories of the kind of uh, institutionalization of the reservation system or these treaties that are being signed and broken and signed and broken as basically the frontier of the West is being formed into statehood or joining the Union. Um, and these things might sound a little kind of obscure as a character, but are very present in something like Standing Rock, or basically all the native communities are very aware of these histories, and they're kind of come up often, you know, in terms of these disputes about something like a pipeline or the river or whatever. These these treaties and the precise kind of words and dates and agreements and violations are very much present and agreed upon. So for us, this might be be like boring high school history or something, but for them, it's totally present. Um, of course, the Fort Laramie Treaty, there's two in 1851 and 1868, and you can see that the pink outline um, is the 1868 Reservation Treaty, which was kind of the Greater Sioux Reservation, and little by little it's lost, you know, the Black Hills is where gold was discovered, so kind of uh, through the army and then through kind of uh, settlers or whatever miners, they're kind of going in and basically going to war, and the army is kind of backing them up, the, the cavalry to kind of basically uh, violate these treaties so people can expand things, etc. Um, and then again, these the current tribal lands are what we have now. These are the current, what are now like reservations. But um, they'll call upon this kind of greater Sioux nation or greater Sioux kind of territory. And if you want to go, you know, it goes back all the way basically to the Louisiana Purchase, you know, between Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon. Uh, where, you know, the U.S. government uh, buys this territory from France. But the thing is, um, and the, the eastern border is the Missouri River, so it's kind of, uh, goes right exactly, the Missouri River is what the kind of whole movement is basically about, uh, the pipeline not hopefully being built through it and then leaking and polluting the Missouri River, goes back literally to the kind of initial purchase. So Lewis and Clark basically are sent by the army to this expedition to go look at this area that they purchased from France that Basically, Americans had never been to. They didn't know what was there, who was there, what was what was going on. So they sent these guys to go wander around and look. But basically, they bought territory that people were already living on for generations that they didn't know these people. But and this can kind of go back to some kind of Christian settler kind of notion of property rights or whatever kind of the inability of indigenous peoples to actually own or have title to the land. But this is a quote from. Clark from Lewis and Clark's journal about the Lakota. Uh, These are the vilest miscreants of the savage race and must ever remain the pirates of the Missouri, you know, speaking of the river. So immediately when the US government is sent in to look at this territory that they just bought, the conflict is immediately about the river. So from day one, basically, there's a conflict between the US government and the army and the native inhabitants about the river, the same river, you know, that we're talking about now. Until such measures are pursued by our government as will make them feel a dependence on its will for their supply of merchandise. Until these people are reduced to order by coercive measure, I am ready for time to pronounce that the citizens of the United States can never enjoy but partially the advantages which the Missouri presents. Um, so this is a kind of obviously a very haunting quote and think about this kind of historical trajectory that uh, is going into basically the Standing Rock occupation. And basically, you know, this is maybe a little obscure, we don't have to go into it, but U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, again, an army division, is who's in charge of building kind of infrastructural projects, and it's basically who's in charge or who's in, in dispute now of the occupation. The main camp is on Army Corps of Engineer territory, 
and the dispute about the final permits and you know roots of the pipeline is under the mandate basically of the Army Corps of Engineers. So, so part part of what's at stake with um, this particular history, and as Matt pointed out, it's kind of like the way it's like a very living memory for the people there is that the pipeline isn't. It's going within a half a mile of the reservation, but it's going through territory agreed to be Lakota in the Fort Larimer Treaty, which is the last treaty they signed with the U.S. government. So to um, the Lakota people, that's unceded territory that's theirs, that they need, not, even though it's not the reservation, the government needs permission from them to build it. And um, in the most recent kind of round of actions that people, we're going to talk about a bit more in a bit, that I'm sure people see on the news, they uh, declared eminent domain on the construction going on there, saying this is within our treaty rights. And um, so that, like, um, a, lot, a lot of the struggle so far has been around land that isn't on the reservation, but land that belongs to them based on this treaty that should be federally recognized, and then a, a struggle around that. Um, so there's also like a, a prophecy that talks about the black snake, and I think there might be something later. But it's basically prophecies that speak about about how there's a black snake that's gonna go that it was just infinite, and it also goes along with all these other prophecy. It's called the condor and the eagle, and speaks about about when the Chortle Island and the land of fire in South America will both join forces and will stand together and respect Mother Earth. But I'll go into it a little bit more later. So people talk about the pipeline as this black snake that's been prophesized long ago that's come to destroy the land. And a lot of the warriors there call themselves black snake killers. And that's one of the big kind of chants in, in the struggle. Um, so um, I'm just going to try to kind of provide a, a little bit of the history of the camp itself to maybe in the, the way that actions have been going on to give some context for what's been going on the past week or two that's maybe been a bit more visible. So the, uh, the tribe has been in a lawsuit with um, the corporation against building the pipeline for almost two years now. Um, but while that's kind of been held up in court, um, people started the Sacred Stone Camp on April 1st of this year. Um, so you know, almost uh, six months ago or something. And that was started mostly by youth of the, the uh, Standing Rock Reservation as a kind of spirit camp. So it kind of like to keep like kind of a, a vigil to monitor when construction would start, but also to kind of like be in prayer against it. Um, and kind of this was a kind of launching camp for kind of like symbolic actions. They, Native youth runners from San Diego Rock ran, I think, 500 miles to the Army Corps of Engineers headquarters to deliver a petition. And when that didn't work, they then ran, I believe, 2,000 miles to Washington, D.C. to deliver another petition. But um, many of the younger organizers there have been camped out since April 1st. Um, and th this is kind of, a, um, this is a map of the, the kind of general encampment in the area. Um, in kind of late July, they actually started um, building and kind of like digging holes to begin building the, um, the pipeline. And that's when a more broad kind of call went out. Um, and that's when the Asechi Saquon was invited to come down to Standing Rock which again is the first time this has happened in about 150 years. And that's when kind of like generally support starts pouring in. So um, the Sacred Stone Camp kind of gets overflown with people and they started an overflow camp on the other side of the river, which is now not on the reservation, on Army Corps of Engineers land, but land that they say is theirs based on the territory. And that's where, is what, that's where now the main camp is. So on the reservation, there's a Sacred Stone Camp and the Rosebud Camp, which is another camp. And then on the other side of the river is the main camp, which is on Army Corps land. And then we had to in a bit, but the, the, when we were there, there was a fourth camp further up the highway, um, right on the pipeline route, that is called either the Sacred Ground Camp or the Frontline Camp. And that's where some of the, the kind of like, that was the camp that was evicted last week, where some of the kind of pitched battles took place. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but. One thing, the name of the Sacred Stone Camp comes from, it's at the intersection of the Missouri and the Cannibal River, which used to create a whirlpool that would create this very particular kind of smooth stone that they use in ceremonies. But um, we'll get to this in a little bit later, but the, the Army Corps engineers in the 40s or 50s redirected one of the rivers, which stopped there being a whirlpool, 
and then stopped the kind of creation of this particular kind of stone. Um, this is kind of like from across the river, this is kind of an overview shot of um, the main camp, the Osadi Sopong camp, um, which is kind of like, that's where maybe at any moment one to 3,000 people are camped out. At the height in early September, there's maybe 5,000 people camped out. And it kind of exists as like, there's a main campfire in the center, but then it's kind of made up of a lot, dozens of kind of like constituent camps, mostly based on um, kind of extended families or a particular tribe. And also within that is um, the Red Warrior Camp, which has been fairly famous, like the direct action camp. And that was also set up along with that in kind of late July. Many of the people that kind of came in at first were Lakota that had been doing Sundance and then came from that. And also between late July and August is when kind of people from, from all over North America and the world being kind of flooding in. And actions became kind of a, almost a daily thing. They were building it only several miles away. So every day there'd be a march from the camp to kind of disrupt construction. And then in early September, just as the, the lawsuit by the tribe is finally going to go to court and they've delivered all these documents kind of documenting um, ancient burial grounds and other sites that would be destroyed by the pipeline route. The, um, the Dakota Access Company begins to hire um, private security to stop people from disrupting their construction, which is happening almost every day now. And so the day after these documents are delivered in court, kind of identifying sacred sites along the construction route, it's unclear if it's intentional or not, but Dapple then goes and bulldozes those specific sites the next day, right after hiring private security. And this is at the same time that the campus kind of reached a peak of membership. So this was the first kind of like, first kind of like national event of a kind of showdown between um, Native Americans and this private security company, way very reminiscent of the Indian Wars. Um, people were attacked by dogs and pepper spray and the like. And in the kind of immediate aftermath of this, um, on the one hand, the state of North Dakota declared a state of emergency, called in the National Guard, which began running a checkpoint on the highway maybe 15 miles north of the camp. Also, the lawsuit that's been kind of pending for two years finally goes to court. The judge throws it out, um, which would have caused an injunction on the construction. Several hours later, the Army Corps of Engineers and several other um, like kind of federal agencies make a statement saying that they decided they need to review the environmental permits of the construction and ask for a temporary injunction on um, construction within 40 miles of the river. Um, so that kind of creates, on the one hand, Standard Rock finally becomes like a national event, but on the other hand, it kind of creates this confused dynamic in the camp where some people are like, well, Obama intervened, maybe we've won. And on the other hand, the Red Warrior Camps begins they stop construction within 40 miles, so you can't march from the camp anymore. So the Red Warrior begins sending um, cars of people to do lockdowns at construction sites maybe an hour away, which kind of runs the risk of becoming this like specialized action thing rather than mass participation. People start getting mass arrested in these actions, so they stop doing actions for a period, which is kind of when we were there. Um, but since, and, uh, yeah, at the same time, the National Guard comes in, the situation was more militarized. You have to go through like a military checkpoint to get there. Um, there's like roadblocks set up and that type of thing. Um, but so after a kind of lull of re-examining re the situation, um, the Red Warrior camp comes up with this idea of rather than doing these kind of like classic, like 90s environmentalist kind of like lockdowns to construction, organizing caravans from the camp to different construction sites to continue a feeling of like mass participation in a way that hopefully navigate around mass arrests. So we were around and helped organize one of the first of these caravans, um, which was a really beautiful experience. Maybe 60 to 70 cars leave the main camp, drive 45 minutes to an hour to these two different construction sites. And as we get there, kind of like, people just flood the construction site and just kind of begin trashing it. All the workers leave. And then the kind of elders kind of calm people down. There's these different ceremonies to uh, kind of like dig up willow trees, plant willow trees on the construction site, perform these different ceremonies and stuff like that. Does anybody else want to say anything about the, the, the action that we were kind of involved with? Um, I, I, I think it was just good noticing, I mean, just specifying like the ceremonial aspect of the actions as well. Because yeah. it's not, it's not as, as they say, like lockdowns and activists, but it's actually a ceremony and you can also feel that at the moment that you're there.
Yeah. There's elders and kids. There's elders, there's kids. It was like people were really making all the efforts and the heart was on making like family friendly and peaceful and just really praying on the land um, and yeah. Yeah, I think the, as we've discussed, like some of the, uh, the tribal hierarchies that had existed before came in very handy during the protests. So that there wasn't this kind of, that they were able to be these kinds of actions that were, you know, illegal, but at the same time, that didn't descend into this chaotic atmosphere and it was still a place. It was very important that the actions are something that the entire community can participate in, that it's not just hardened youths, that it's actually older people, young children can all feel comfortable and safe. And it was done through basically being very, very organized and having this kind of thing where it wasn't about necessarily who who did what or who did this or who does that, but just like actually just respecting the tribal hierarchies based on who was an elder that already existed. And that allowed the actions to go actually very smoothly and they were very organized. And no one left until everybody had, you know, uh, old the elderly and children went in first, warriors stood by on either side, protected them, and no man was left behind. Um, so it was this kind of, it was a, it was a very interesting kind of, of way of doing it. And yet the ceremonial part was very important. We can get more into that later. But just, just to kind of tease a teaser, they, when, before we, um, um, action, they would say, bring your prayers, your drums, and your flags. Those are the three most important things to bring to an action. The flags because of the unity. Um, the prayers we'll get into, and then the drums to kind of whip you up and, and create a sense of energy and momentum. But <clears throat> the, uh, the importance of the flags, I think two, there were two, there's two main actions here, right? There's the occupation itself, which is an action, and then there's these specified actions that block uh, construction at certain points. But one of the things that makes the occupation itself such an important action with its own momentum is the tribal unity. The tribal unity and the creation of a new kind of pan-tribal community that is formed in protest on Standing Rock is to me one of the most powerful things. And so the, 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 the bringing of the flags everywhere it harkens back to that because it's always about demonstrating the, um, the, yeah, the different tribes that are there. <clears throat> so yeah, for the past month or two there's been this kind of constant innovation and tactics um, as the situation changes so they you know, did lockdowns, so they started getting arrested, so they just started doing these mass caravans. The police started having a more and more militarized response to the mass caravans, doing some mass arrests. So they started organizing what they called toxic tours, where they would drive one or two hundred cars on a tour of all these construction sites. As the workers would see all these natives showing up, they would leave, but then they wouldn't get out. They would just, the, the, the protesters would just drive to the next construction site. So they shut down construction all this place, but never give the police an opportunity to confront them. Um, and so it, it's been a month of this kind of constant innovation. And at the same time, there's been a kind of spread of the movement across the country. This is a pretty great shot of, um, on November 2nd, 10 Native youth from Standing Rock showed up at Hillary Clinton's um, campaign offices in downtown Brooklyn and built a teepee in her, the lobby of her office, performed a ceremony, and then delivered her a petition saying that you have to choose a side on the struggle. Later that day, she released a, a pretty, like, a pretty soft statement, just kind of saying nothing. Like, you know, people have the right to protest, but workers have the right to get their job done. Um, um, there, there was an article I read today kind of arguing that we, like, we would maybe assume that it's because that she has some relationship to the kind of moneyed interests behind the pipeline and um, the oil companies, but this is actually arguing that the Democratic Party relies on the support of the like, large unions and the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO has released a statement in favor of the pipeline and has formally condemned its constituent unions that have sent delegations to Standing Rock, saying that they're taking a side against the working class. So in this way, it might actually be organized labor itself that is kind of playing a reactionary role in keeping the Democratic Party from taking a side, um, which is complicated, right? But um, also, in, 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 the past, in the past couple of weeks, um, we've seen a kind of proliferation of actions as different counties from the Midwest have sent sheriffs to kind of back up police in the protests. Um, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, there's been this big movement to stop their sheriffs from going. So there's been all these high school walkouts, there's been all these marches. They eventually occupied the sheriff's office, and the local police were like, this isn't our problem, we're not going to take a side. 
So they just occupied the office of the sheriffs until they were forced to leave Standing Rock and come back to Minneapolis. There's also been um, a proliferation of kind of like lockdowns and actions that banks in um, San Francisco, in Utah, in New York, um, and, and th this kind of thing is a way to kind of like build, build a movement to kind of show pressure everywhere, which I, I think is pretty interesting and important. Almost most interesting is that in Iowa, where amongst kind of like the general population, there's much more opposition to the pipeline than in North Dakota. In North Dakota, most of the homeowners that have been kind of like eminent domain in a way to build a pipeline are kind of okay with it. In Iowa, people are like, We're, we will fight this to the end. So they started their own camp of mostly white, mostly kind of homeowners that has also been doing a series of actions and has gotten really militant. So that's been a pretty interesting development as well. Um, so the same day that people, um, a big, that people occupied Hillary's office in downtown Brooklyn, it's kind of been the second major kind of like national event at Standing Rock. Um, in the week leading up before it, the pipeline in, in North Dakota is almost complete. It's probably more than 90% 90, 90 built. And so as it's happened, the DAPL has just kind of choose to ignore the injunction they voluntarily agreed to earlier to not build within 40 miles of the river and just started building closer and closer to the reservation. The Obama administration again was like, we just want to remind everyone of this agreement that everyone agreed to to wait to these permanent things. And the company just didn't respond. Um, so kind of acknowledging that even though they put up a, a, a tight struggle, they're reaching the end of it. The Osetis Saquon agreed to kind of like um, declare eminent domain over the land within their territory right. They set up a new camp on land that, depending on who you ask, either belongs to the pipeline company or the tribe. Um, they built a camp there on the pipeline route and then barricaded the highway. Um, and then for a week, there was a kind of standoff. The police would come in. They'd negotiate to take down the barricades. They'd leave the material there. They'll set up a checkpoint somewhere else. The police would come in again. And for several days, there was kind of constant threat of there being a raid. And then finally, it happens. The, um, you know, like the, the police show up, but along a kind of access route set up by the oil company, so not where the barricades have been set up before. Other armored cars show up on the barricade routes. Both the main highway 1806 and 134 becomes barricaded, one by the kind of official kind of um, Osechi Soquan and the other specifically by the Red Warrior camp. And then there becomes this kind of day-long stand down where um, you know, as the as the police are coming in through this access route and also on the highway, people park their cars in the way, slash the tires of their own cars, and remove their license plate as a way to stop the police. People set up barricades that they'd spent all the night before driving material over with trucks, so of like trees, barbed wire, tires, and cars. As the police get to the frontline camp, they torch the protesters, set both the barricades on fire, and defend them. Eventually, the police get through. Um, other people like lock themselves to trucks and then build teepees in the middle of the highway. And kind of what ensues, in the meantime, there's a kind of tension between different members of the camp of whether they should kind of peacefully sit in the road and let themselves get arrested or whether they should fight against the police. Eventually, the, the police clear the, the frontline camp, make over 100 arrests. Other folks, re while this is all going on, people take the opportunity to torch the construction site nearby. People then fall back to the intersection of the two highways, barricade that, there's another standoff. They then fall back onto the bridge right on the way to the reservation, barricade that with like tree trunks and a torn down kind of like um, electric road sign, set that on fire, and then there's a 12 hour standoff on the board of the reservation between um, the National Guard, I think eight sheriff's counties on one hand, and then on the other hand, um, the Red Warrior camp and like some other participants in the camp with kind of like Molotov cocktails and branches thrown over on one side and um, rubber bullets and tear gas on the other side. Eventually, the police retreat, leaving some of their vehicles behind. They get set on fire. Um, <laughs> and while this is all going on, private DAPL security tries to invade the kind of the other side of the camp and this one dude just like shows up with an assault rifle. Um, he eventually is chased by camp security into a lake. 
And then eventually the Bureau of Indian Affairs that sort of is kind of like the enemy of people on reservations shows up and arrests him and people set his car on fire and use it on the barricades. Um, there, there's a rumor going around that I'm not sure it was confirmed or not that other state troopers had tried to cross through the reservation in South Dakota but was stopped by Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that's kind of like a complicated, interesting kind of like breakdown of the relationship within the state. Um, and then two days, or yeah, yesterday, there was another kind of like big meteor moment where um, I guess the, this hill is, is sacred and there's also where construction's going on. So the night before, people built a kind of DIY like wooden bridge along the water and then that morning tried to cross it to perform a prayer ceremony and also blockade construction. Riot police line up on the other side of the water and there's a fairly kind of, from what I saw, intense battle of people trying to cross this bridge while they're getting shot at by rubber bullets and pepper spray. They, other people try to canoe and motorboat across the river and then lots of other people just jump in and swim across the river and there's this kind of like pitched battle along the river. Um, and that, that kind of leads us where, where we are today now is like the situation continues to escalate um, and militarize on both sides. The pipeline's almost done and it's kind of unclear what, like where things can go from now. Um, I also wanted to take a moment and look at some of the worldviews differences that have led to this, I guess. Um, there's a Judeo Christian and Native cosmology, so I wanted to read Genesis 1 28. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the earth, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Um, and I was raised Christian, and I was told to take a stewardship of the land, but just by its, just like the word once we think about the word stewardship of the minion, then that by itself creates a hierarchy, um, which is not present on native cosmology or yeah, ways of life. All of creation is alive and needs to be respected and cared for. And there is an interconnectedness and codependence that is celebrated. Um, there's also like the principle of the seven generations where when for any decision that has to be made when things what is how is this going to affect to the in seven generations um, and just to read it quickly it's seven generations after contact with the Europeans um, the, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Ongo Ongo would see the day when the elm trees would die. The strange animals would be born deformed and without the proper limbs. Huge stones monsters would cheer upon the face of the earth. The rivers would burn. The air would burn the eyes of men. The birds would fall far from the sky. The fish would die in the water. And a man would grow ashamed of the way that he had treated his mother and provided the earth. Um, and the other prophecy that I mentioned before is the eagle and the condor, which is especially like warm to my heart because I'm from Ecuador and we have our own struggles with oil companies in the Amazons. So it was really great to see how, as we were saying, like the also bigger circle of indigenous nations are coming together to in solidarity within each other. Um, and also just talk a little bit about infrastructure as well and how railroads, dam pipelines, mine intervene in the landscape itself and what consequences it brings and how we see these infrastructures in the name of prosperity and mother, um, modernization, uh, but they really carry along other consequences that are not only of to think of it as environment, but or to think of it like natural resources, but how that actually also really affects in the like the worldview um, of how one is perceiving. If if someone in is when when the buffalo population uh, was diminished, it wasn't just like oh animals as resources are done. By no, it's like there's an interconnectedness. There's these belief of like the buffaloes voluntarily um, given to be like approaching people 
to be eaten because there is interconnectedness and they are sacred because they are alive. And the same thing is with salmon. Um, and the same is what is happening in the sacred lands in the standing rock and the water. Um, now I wanted to go back to the point I was making earlier and if you can come with me and return back a little bit to the history. Uh, it's important to understand, as Vanessa was saying, how these infrastructural projects are not only a spiritual but like an actual political colonization. So to give one good example, um, yeah, to give an example, the, the, so it's important to understand the Lakota are the last um, tribe of natives to have military resist, militarily resisted the United States. When the Fort Laramie Treaty was created, it was created with the intention that they could pass through the area un, unharmed to have access to the West Coast, white people at the time, the white settlers. Uh, the, the native people said, if you want to pass through, that's fine. And the minute you build any kind of train line, or that we have a problem. So it's the, it's the infrastructure that's consistently been the issue. And in the old days, it was, and it's the same kind of constellation of different agencies. You have the federal, um, the government, and then you have the private. And private mercenaries working for railroad companies or gold mines are just as active as DAPL is today. And in fact, the, gold, the, black, uh, the black Hills, which is their sacred spot, they're the most sacred area, is where, most of the, is where gold was discovered. And that's what facilitated the initial gold rush. And that's when the Fort Laramie Treaty was discarded and they built Mount Rushmore on the Black Hills, which is incredibly insulting. But just uh, one thing with the buffalo. So one of the ways that they were able to defeat the Lakota was by annihilating their food source. So the United States government went on a campaign of uh, buffalo extermination, systematically, purposefully exterminating the United States buffalo in order to eradicate the native food supply. So you think that's both an environmental thing but also a political weapon. Another example is um, the 1944 Pick Sloan's Act, which basically uh, it was the United Army Corps of Engineers uh, created a dam system uh, against the will of the native people. That's what kind of uh, diverted the Cannonball River so that the sacred stones wouldn't, weren't being made anymore. But not only that, it led to flooding, led to massive flooding, primarily of native lands. The people whose land was flooded were kicked off the reservation that land was declared eminent domain and then it became confiscated, in a sense, by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, which is where what's happening in Standing Rock is going down today. So there's this history where infrastructure is tied closely to eating away and chipping away at native sovereignty. And um, one more last point, the, all these reservations, Pine Ridge, Standing Rock, certainly Pine Ridge, they're actually prisoner of war camps. That's literally what they are. They're prisoner of war camps who 100 years later now we're calling them reservations. But they, 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 the, the history of warfare is very, very evident. Um, it's true of all native people, but it's particularly evident because, in the case of the Lakota because of how recent it is, relatively speaking. Um, I just wanted to put a little bit of different um, acts as well, that besides the treaty that we were discussing that it, um, about the land itself, there's also acts that were trying to secure that there's going to be respect for the water or um, the Flood Control Act, the Clean Water Act, and it just like there's it's not only one, like it's not only treaties, it's not only about land, it's all these different types that have been continuously viol viol violated. Yeah. yeah. One of the things too that's interesting because right around the time that we were there in late September, um, the chairman of the Standing Rock Tribe was in Geneva trying to make a petition to the UN and the United Nations has recently gone to Standing Rock itself to monitor some of the conditions of the brutality and repression and jail and prison conditions for the protesters. But it's interesting, at the, the bottom of this, uh, it says in 1924, uh, Native Americans were kind of unilaterally given access to citizenship of the United States, which is something that they didn't necessarily ask for. And then in doing so, in making Native peoples able to be citizens, which I guess you could think of as a good thing, it kind of undermined their own national kind of identification of being Lakota or something. So it kind of simultaneously takes away their own possibility of understanding themselves or relating to themselves as separate national identities or whatever. So it's this kind of complicated uh, dynamic of assimilation, basically. But now for, you know, so for the Lakota people or the Sioux Nation or the Standing Rock tribe, 
theoretically, they, they're not part of North Dakota, that the, the reservation itself is a federal kind of jurisdictional thing that would then relate to the federal government, so Obama, basically. So the only thing above Obama would be the United Nations. But the United Nations doesn't rec necessarily recognize these tribal nations as like member state nations or something. So there's this kind of weird, unresolved uh, middle ground or kind of gray area about what exactly a tribal nation is how does it fit within international law? How can these kind of grievances be addressed, basically? So I, I think these kind of jurisdictional things, so if you have like the Morton County Sheriff's Department who's primarily leading these kind of raids, the Standing Rock tribe would be like, we're not part of uh, Morton County, or like even North Dakota or something, would be like, we're not part of North Dakota. Our thing, we are, this is our own nation, this is our own national territory or whatever. So these kind of things become kind of interesting in these disputes, basically. And in basically these contestations over the river or land or property or public property or private property, et cetera. Um, I don't want to nerd out too much about it, but I think, you know, basically something like Standing Rock opens up these kind of historical questions of settler colonialism, of state formation of both the state formation of North Dakota, but the U.S. state formation itself. And it kind of points to the fact that settler colonialism itself is an ongoing process, it's a contemporary phenomenon, it's not something that's resolved, it's not that Indians lost and you know that they're kind of trying to reclaim something or you know struggle for civil rights or something like this, they're still struggling for national rights basically, uh, the, the national recognition that they're separate from the United States, they were never integrated into the United States, they don't want to be integrated into the United States, so something like this kind of contestation over the pipeline theoretically opens up all of these questions. So it's not just about the pipeline or not the pipeline, but it's about a national recognition. Often what people there say is that we're a separate nation and the U.S. government needs to sit down with us the way they would with Russia or Japan and negotiate as nation to nation, and like that's the only way it'll work. Um, also in 2014, before all this happened, Obama went and visited Standing Rock. It's the only time a president's gone and visited a reservation. It's the only time he's visited a reservation. And I think he like went to a powwow, did some photo ops, and like you know gave a speech. And I think he thought that was that. Instead, when he the tribal leaders confronted him, and they're like, "Here's a long document of all of our treaty violations that your government needs to address." And that's the only thing we want to talk about. Okay, um, I'm gonna wrap wrap up with some conceptual observations uh, about what was going on there. Um, I mean, this is going to sound a little abstract or weird, but it's actually kind of real over there. I'm not, you know, tripping. So um, the, the, so there's a line between, you know, the way we think of intentionality is kind of quite different. Over there, actually, there is like a psychosocial connection to dreams, and dreams are actually an important mode of intentionality. And I'll give you an example. So this uh, photo, when we were planning one of an action, a lady who was from another tribe, um, not Lakota, um, I think... Apache, there we go. Um, she was basically saying, I had a dream that when we get to the action, we're gonna pick up uh, dirt and throw it back onto the pipeline to cover the pipeline. And then when I hear that I'm coming from the city, I'm like, this is, all right, cool. Let's get back to talking about serious things. So then, but then when we actually go there, it happens, right? And it's actually the most beautiful poetic moment of the protest, and the protest is built off of poetry. Um, so that was one example. Another example is a, a gentleman there who was teaching jiu-jitsu, which was one of the most popular. You have different classes going around simultaneously, obviously. And jiu-jitsu, he was teaching jiu-jitsu, and uh, I was like, oh, why are you teaching jiu-jitsu? He was like, I had a dream that I should be teaching jiu-jitsu at Standing Rock, and then he came and did it. So if that's, it's a very different sense of uh, time, how time functions and how the connection between things functions. Um, another example, well, Another conceptual thing I want to bring up is the TP itself. Oh, okay. Well, this, so I, I'm going to bring you back to the Native and the Refugee, right? Our project connecting Palestinian refugee camps and Native reservations. A sidebar of that project is analyzing the history of um, Lakota delegations or Native delegations who went to Lebanon in the early 80s during the Civil War to train with the PLO. AIM. AIM, basically AIM, yeah, exactly. AIM in 1981. So this lady, who's this like kind of like motherly figure, was in Lebanon in 1981. Um, it's the first and only time she ever left the United States. 
And there was another gentleman in, in Pine Ridge who we spoke to at great length, who also went to Lebanon in 1991, the same trip as her. And a lot of these people, had, they were young, they were 22, 23, 24, never left America before or after. And the one time they do is to go to a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon in the midst of the Civil War. So that, I mean, that's pretty, um, pretty amazing. But I want to talk a little bit about the teepee, and there's a lot that goes into it. First of all, um, when we were there, the first thing they said when we're trying to get a sense of where things are located, they said, watch the teepees, because the teepees don't change. Uh, the tents will come and go, but the teepees remain. So base yourself directionally off the teepees, number one. Number two, the teepees themselves are what people need materially to last through the winter. Uh, they're much more durable than tents, and they will keep, they will keep people warm. And last but not least, it is their traditional um, mode of dwelling. And what's interesting about the teepee on many different levels, first of all, in the summer, it can be, you know, it, can ha it has three sticks, and you can keep the flaps open at the bottom to have air circulate. In the winter, you can add two more sticks. It becomes tighter, and you put kind of grass or hay at the bottom to insulate it. But what's interesting about it is many different social, social things. So first of all, it's a circle as opposed to a square house. And um, one of our people there, this guy named Vic Camp, he was talking for a while. He's a traditional ghost dancer, a um, sun dancer rather. Sun yeah, sun dancer. And, and a leader of one, uh, one of these like elder leaders. And he was talking about how the fact that living in a circle house is completely different than living in a square house, which is like a container. And he called them tin houses. And a lot of the native housing is substandard. It's made of weak material. People actually freeze to death in the winter, children sometimes. And it's these kind of tin houses. And he said, when you're living in a tin house or a square house, especially this kind of private dwelling, you're more likely to be a bad person because you're secluded from the rest of society. And then you, you might beat your wife, you might beat your children. You, you have, you're a different kind of person. But when you're living with a community, you hold yourself up to a higher standard of being. And for me, that was not just a metaphor about the TV, but about Standing Rock in general. Now, if you look at native um, reservations around there, these places have the highest rates of unemployment of suicide, of sexual violence, of alcoholism, of drug use. I mean, through the roof, all these things. So for these people to be able to come together and create a completely safe space where children and women can walk around where there's no drugs whatsoever, there's no alcohol whatsoever, there's no fighting whatsoever, is really remarkable. It's a testament, this idea of pulling yourself up at a higher level to be part of a community. Um, so that was one thing. And then I, I think um, two more points. One more point is the idea of prayer. Um, a lot of this is the idea that prayer is not just simply an act, but it's a mode of being. So um, before you do it, all, almost throughout the day, anytime you stop, you, you pray. It doesn't mean pray to God, it means burning some incense, burning tobacco. But basically it's a mode of consistent reflection that relates to how you experience time almost. And at the protests themselves, before, any kind of, before and after the actions, you pray. And um, a guy was giving a speech... Um, Clyde Bellacourt, and he said, or was it his nephew? They both spoke, but his nephew was saying, um, and he was a kind of the leader of a, a SETI camp. He was saying, um, you're always in prayer here from the moment you sleep to the moment you wake up. And if, if you're, you shouldn't smoke a cigarette, but if you do smoke a cigarette, consider it as a prayer because you're burning tobacco. And I found that really um, yeah, powerful and beautiful. The last point I wanted to make about the uh, TP and this mode of representation is that um, over there, the, the, um, the teepee doesn't really, when we think in Western conception, we think of things representing other things, like, for example, um, the, the flap that covers it, we think that it represents the mother. It doesn't represent the mother, it literally is, in a sense, the mother. It literally is the feminine because it keeps you warm. And the teepee is literally um, the woman's space. Um, for example, when the, uh, the, the, uh, the sticks are arranged in coordination with different stars, it, uh, and, the, and the reason that they are that is because these stars are your ancestors. Um, and so that allows for a kind of directional um, uh, way of dealing with um, how you locate the teepee. So when it, when it, and, then, and, and then that's in the sticks are the generations going up to the sky. So it's not that they represent these things. In fact, they kind of... Um, not necessarily are, but suggest these things. And they're part of a, a broader psychosocial reality, rather than being a mere kind of dead or cold metaphor. And that idea was hearkened to by, um, if anybody's ever read Philip Bourdieu, he has this great passage called The Kabyle House, where he analyzes the traditional Berber homes in the Sahara Desert. And he talks about how um, the feminine part of the house didn't represent him, but it kind of literally was. It was this 
a darker, kind of um, softer part of the house. And then the part on the outside, which was colder, exposed to the sun, was the masculine part of the house. Um, the entrances, which were called the openings, always faced Mecca on purpose. because it, And it wasn't just an entrance, it was an opening. And a lot of that is encoded in the language, and it's the same thing here. Um, a lot, a lot is lost through the language. And uh, to understand these things, it's really important to understand the Lakota language. And unfortunately, that's no longer the case as much because the United States uh, forbid Native people from speaking their language throughout most of the 20th century. And um, what would happen was with the boarding school system, they would take kids at a very young age away from their mother, sorry, away from their mother and put them in Christian boarding schools. And this was done to kind of take, they said, uh, take, kill the Indian, keep the man. So destroy the native aspects of them and then retain something that could be useful to America. So by doing that, they didn't allow them to speak their language and they disrupted the kind of, um, the way that mothers had raised their kids for generations, right? So when you, when you take kids away from their mother at an early age, you disrupt the kind of maternal logic and the maternal ways of raising children is built up. So it's, it's, it's also kind of spiritual genocide to rob people of their language, their culture, and leave them kind of these like shells. So that's it. Uh, uh, just uh, on the PowerPoint, just some kind of shots we took of just like everyday life at the camp and kind of like some of the infrastructure that's kind of been established to facilitate the reproduction of the camp, which at least to me was really fascinating. So within a study of Saquon, the main camp, there's now a, an elementary school for, for kids whose parents have been like, we live at the encampment now, this is our home. <laughs> so there, there's an entire school there. There's a pirate radio station based out of school bus. Mm -hmm. um, there's not only like a, a medic tent set up by street medics, there's also a massage tent, an herbal medicine tent, and a place to go and get herbal teas and kind of like that kind of remedies. There is, um, <clears throat> there's po probably a dozen different sweat lodges kind of spread out throughout the tent from different tribes for their kind of like um, different ceremonial things. There's pretty much ceremonies going on nonstop in different parts of the encampment um, in the different ways that different tribes kind of perform that. Um, at the, the main Asadi Sokan camp, there's a big kind of fire um, that there's different ev events and performances and powwows and also speeches going on nonstop and then a massive communal kitchen. But also the camp's made up of all these kind of constituent camps, mostly extended families or tribes that each have their own kind of communal kitchen and fire. Um, there's probably a half a dozen horse stables spread out throughout the camp. We heard that there was a kind of a system of like horse, um, Oh, there was a horse messenger system to deliver messages throughout different um, camps or stuff like that. There used to be a horse racetrack at one point in the camp. Um, there's a massive solar power powering station. There's almost like a fleet of motorboats and canoes and stuff to get back and forth between the different camps on different side of the rivers, but also for other projects like that. Um, so th there's the kind of like there's. The, the main camp itself, it, it's almost like a small town now with like different neighborhoods. People started putting up road signs while we were there. Um, so th there's this whole sense in which like a kind of particular kind of life is reproduced at the camp, which is really interesting. Um, like I was saying before, it, it's, in some ways there's a lot of resonance with the other kind of like movements of the past five years where kind of like the, the kind of like blockade becomes a, a major tactic um, within these movements and then the encampment, but then as kind of like everyday life under capitalism kind of in a certain way breaks within the encampment, a new kind of life is kind of created. So in this way, there's a lot of resonance with other struggles going on, but in some way, Standing Rock is able to pose, I think, better answers to some of the questions that maybe came up for us as participants in Occupy Wall Street and these other struggles. Whereas I, I think for us in Occupy kind of coming to these encampments, where people that largely have been like stripped of any kind of sense of a community and had to kind of improvise that on the spot um, and improvise a kind of decision-making structure and figure out and experiment with what it is, the kind of world that we want through these encampments that I think we ended up kind of coming to the conclusion that like, it isn't clear what kind of world that we want and the kind of fragile alliances built to make these encampments possible from different kind of identities and class alliances broke down fairly quickly, whereas the camp is kind of like, they already, in many ways, exist within a, a kind of world inside and against the world that we live in. And so it's very easy for them to be like, this is the particular world that we envision as an alternative capitalism. They already have a very specific set of decision-making structures and all these things. So 
while it, it's similar to these other encampments in the sense that like there's all these experiments with other ways of living, it's, it's much more kind of coherent and strong in a certain way because there's a very particular history and kind of structure to it. And I think that provides a lot of the reason why the camp has been so durable and so strong, you know, almost six months now engaged with like almost everyday battles. So I, that, that to me is one of like the major takeaways of kind of like for those of us that not only support the struggle on there but are curious about building struggles around our own issues in the places that we live, I think there's a lot to learn from like that aspect of it and not like the reproduction of the camp and the kind of like meaning and experiments going on there and not just the kind of forward confrontations with the state. Just quickly, this is a video that Vanessa primarily shot and edited, a kind of silent home movie version of our time. It's late September in Standing Rock. But we kind of spoke for a lot enough. There's questions. You want to open up to a kind of conversation or discussion, and this can play in a loop. But uh, thank you all so much for having us and listening, and hope this was helpful. Just really quickly, the, the kid in the Adidas tracksuit that walked by at the beginning of the video is Crazy Horse's great-great-grandson.